What's up guys, your host and humble narrator Buck Johnson here and you might notice this recording sounds different than the usual podcast and that is because I'm sitting outside here in Lockhart, Texas recording this ad into my iPhone. It probably sounds pretty crappy. Well, I'm doing this to show you something very cool. Many of you guys know that my production team works over at Podsworth Media and they've been producing my show for quite a while. I get a lot of questions and people asking who does your podcast? Why does it sound great? And I'm telling you why. It's because the guys at Podsworth are amazing. They've got this brand new online app for taking rough recordings like this and making them a whole lot cleaner and more listenable with just a few easy clicks. It will remove background noise it reduces plosives, it fixes clipping, which is distortion from recording with the gain up too high, clipping, which is distortion from recording with the gain up too high, which I can promise you I've done many times, and they fix this for me. It removes clicks and pops. It removes clicks and pops, and then also levels out the dialogue, so there's no crazy where the guest sounds too loud or the interviewer sounds too quiet. Here's what you guys can do. All of y'all that are interested in recording podcasts or audiobooks or anything, if you're a pastor and you want your sermon recorded, whatever the case may be, go to podsworth.com and click Get Started. You drag and drop your audio files or click to open your file manager. This also works on your smartphone's web browser. You customize your settings that you want, but the default works fine on most podcast recordings. Then enter code BUCK50. B U C K five zero for fifty percent off of your first order. You don't need an account, just an email address and payment. And you'll get a download link in your email for your cleaned up files. How cool is this? The guys at Podsworth run everything they do through this app before they do anything else to it. So all of my recordings go through this app that we're talking about. It works great. Like I said, any spoken word recordings, obviously for podcasts, YouTube videos, sermons, audiobooks, whatever, it will make awful recordings sound listenable and much more professional. So, like I said, go to podsworth.com and click get started. You can use promo code BUCK50, B U C K 50, for 50% off of your first order. You can use promo code BUCK50, B U C K 50, for 50% off off of your first order. Let's get it. You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in half, but I call them the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash your science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Counterflow Podcast. As always, I am your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson, coming to you once again out of Lockhart, Texas here. And today we've got a fellow Texan on the show, Father John Whiteford, friend of the show, is back once again, and he's always good to get on. Father John and I were recently together at the Philip Ludwell III Orthodox Fellowship Conference in North Carolina, Tobaccoville, North Carolina, to be exact. We're going to talk about some of the things he touched upon in his speech there, discussing orthodoxy, Southern agrarianism, the lifestyle, and maybe some of the hard lessons that were learned when uh, the North and the neoliberal mindset ended up winning the Civil War and what that led to, and maybe what we're looking to go back to in some aspects, some of the good aspects of some of the agrarian rooted to the earth lifestyle. We're going to get, well, obviously, well, not obviously, not everyone knows this, but Father John wrote an article entitled Sola Scriptura in the Vanity of Their Minds, which laid out many of the theological reasons for his conversion. Back in 1995, he wrote this. We're going to get into what is Sola Scriptura and what were his issues with it. He breaks down the history of it and what it led to and whatnot, we get into that. Man, we have a great discussion on foreign policy as well. And Father used to be a neocon, a neoconservative, and not actually one, if you guys trace the history of the neocon movement. No, Father John was not one of those, but 
he subscribed to that philosophy, let's say, as far as foreign policy goes, until he became orthodox. And he started to realize a few important things on why you actually can't be that way and be orthodox. We get into all of this. It's a great discussion. Father John Whiteford is an archpriest and pastor at St. Jonah Orthodox Church in Spring, Texas. He is the current general editor of the St. Innocent Liturgical Calendar. He is also the dean of the Southern Deanery, Texas and Louisiana of the Diocese of Chicago and Mid-America Real Corps, which uh, means he's over my area too. Fellow Texan, Father John Whiteford, welcome back to the show, sir. How are you? Thank you. Doing good. You've been on before. Uh, you're, you're active in the Telegram group, the, the Counterflow Telegram group, and I know a lot of people that listen to this show um, know exactly who you are because your blog's very well known and, and very helpful, I might add, too. But I always give people a chance to give a little intro for yourself and talk about your blog, too, because for those of you um, listening, I got inquirers listening, I got Orthodox people listening, I got Libertarians listening. It's a very helpful blog on all kinds of stuff. I said this when I introduced you in the uh, conference we were at. You can just go up there and type in an Orthodox type of topic that you're looking for, and more than likely, you have written about it, and I find that very helpful. So, having said all of that, um, give give the audience whatever you'd like to tell them. Well, I'm an Orthodox priest, converted to the Orthodox faith back in 1990, was made a deacon in 95, and a priest in 2001, and uh, our parish is St. Joan Orthodox Church in Spring, Texas. Uh, as you mentioned, if you go to the, the blog, as Father spelled out, john.blogspot.com, but if you go to Saint spelled out, jonah.org. That's our parish website. And there's an article section where it has links to the blog, but it also has some, it has links to some articles that are not on the blog because some of these articles are too long really to put on a blog and have them be formatted properly. Uh, so you, you'll get some additional stuff if you go to the article section on the website. And my sermons are posted on the website. They're also on Ancient Faith Radio, except for the ones that maybe were too hot to, for Ancient Faith Radio. <laughs> And uh, and I edit the Saint Innocent Liturgical Calendar, and uh, am connected with the Ludwell Orthodox Fellowship, as you know, because you introduced me at the Ludwell Conference that we just had last month. Yeah, and I got to meet your daughter and son-in-law, which was neat. Your daughter's voice is incredible. I I, I heard her, of course, in the choir the next on that Sunday morning, and it, really incredible. Yeah, I had lots of compliments from the people in her parish. For those of you who don't know, we're talking about my youngest daughter lives in North Carolina, and she goes to the parish that was hosting the conference. And I got lots of compliments from people in the parish about how great she of an asset she was to the choir, how nice her voice was. And uh, my daughter, both my daughters were singing as soon as they were old enough to start talking. And uh and so, so they, they've been singing the choir constantly. And fortunately, in our parish, we still have a very great choir director who taught them how to sing in a way that a professional singer would be taught. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so Catherine, now what she she often is invited to sing the national anthem at Republican events. She's the co-chair of the National Young Republicans. Uh, I encourage her to get informed enough about politics to be an informed voter. But I might have overdone it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of that conference, the, uh, the conference you and I were just at, can you kind of tell people that aren't familiar with the concept of the conference and, and what it was like and how, what you thought of the very first annual one? I thought it went very well. We, if we'd have had 50 people there, I would have thought it was successful and we wound up having to turn people away because we maxed out the capacity of the venue that we had reserved to host the conference. I think we had about 120 people. And uh, so next time we're going to aim a little higher in terms of how much our capacity is going to be. But the Ludwell Orthodox Fellowship is focused on spreading orthodoxy in the South and connecting the good things in Southern culture with orthodoxy in ways that help bring people into the church, but also help people who are in the church learn how to live as better human beings and therefore as better Christians. And uh, as you know, at, before and after the conference, there were lots of people online that knew nothing about what actually was going to be said or was said after the fact at the conference that so were disparaging it in all kinds of ways. 
And uh, we're just focused on spreading orthodoxy in the South, and it's not limited to white people in the South. We're, right. we're, we're talking about Southern culture, which is a culture shared by Black people in the South, Hispanic people in the South, uh, French uh, C- Cajun people in the South, and people who are all kinds of mixes of all kinds of stuff, including American Indians. And uh, there are obviously regional differences in the South, but there's sort of an overall uh, similarity in the various subcultures, you might say, that they have things in common. And uh, if we were, if, if I lived in, in the Pacific Northwest, we might be having a conference about that. We'd find some some way to try to connect those people with orthodoxy. And if we were living in uh, Mexico, we'd be going at it a different way. And if we were in China, we'd be going at it a different way. But we want to spread orthodoxy to people. And we're not we're not trying to exclude anybody. And And if you actually listen to the videos of the things that were said at the conference, which right now two of the talks are posted and they're rolling them out as they get them prepared, you can hear for yourself that you know we weren't uh, burning any crosses or talking about any hate or anything like that. It was all highest orthodox stuff and how we can reach people. That's what that's what the conference was about. Yes, and then uh, there was an article that you and I both saw, quote misquoting things and, and painting things as they were not, which is interesting. I know the person knows t- the talks are going to be dropped, but. You know, journalists also understand that people read a thing and they make their opinion up and they're not going to go do the research and watch your talk or or uh, any of them, Metropolitan Jonah. Speaking of your talk, by the way, I'll link to in the comments, excuse me, in the uh, show notes for this page, uh, for this episode. One of the fascinating things I didn't know about you that you uh, discussed in the talk was that, like a lot of people, I think, especially in our area in Texas, uh, Early on, your political, your foreign policy views were sort of somewhat in line with the neoconservatives. And what, what I thought was really neat is you said, until you became orthodox. And you'd often hear people from the left back then. I mean, I can go into a whole rant on how the neoconservative ideologies of the left, but that aside, um, people would say, well, George Bush can't be a Christian. And they would, they would knock on Christianity because he's starting all of these wars. And I don't know, now that I, that I learn more about orthodoxy and some of the stuff you're pointing out, they weren't being honest actors, but there's a nugget of what they were saying that could be possibly true. And I want to ask you uh, how and why this, this shift in, in your view on foreign policy switched around once you became orthodox. Well, the first presidential election that I paid attention to was when I was in the four, fourth grade and Jimmy Carter was running against Gerald Ford. And like a lot of evangelicals, I supported Jimmy Carter. So I actually gave a speech in my fourth grade class in favor of Jimmy Carter because that, w- that was really the last time the Democrat candidate got the majority of evangelical votes in this country because he identified as a born-again Christian. He was a Southern Baptist. And I remember, I think it was Adrian Rogers, on uh, you know who who was a Baptist preacher on TV, uh, saying, "I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but he has the same initials as Jesus Christ." <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, but then his presidency. I mean, looking back on it and understanding a little bit more about the Jeffersonian tradition, there's actually a lot of good things you can point to in Jimmy Carter's presidency. But he he bungled a lot of things, at least as far as the American people were concerned. And certainly economically, we were not doing well. We were having double digit inflation back when they calculated in, inflation in a more honest way than they do now. I think inflation yes. worse now than it was back then. There was a period of time where you could not buy gas right. at, on certain days. You bet de- de- depend on the last digit of your license plate. And even if it was a day that you could buy gas, you had to find a gas station that had gas for you to buy. Gas stations would have a red flag if they were out of gas and a green flag if they had gas. And so when you're in a country that has never seen anything like that since the Great Depression, uh, that that was a not a good time. And, and so when Ronald Reagan came along, I was all on board with that. You know, and uh, one thing that's interesting is, you know, my father was a Southerner and uh, my parents got divorced when I was six. And so I didn't have as much 
direct influence from him as I wish that I'd had. But for one thing, he was the handy, he was a handyman. He knew how to do anything, but none of that was passed on to me because after the age of nine, I only saw him on, uh, you know, maybe once a year if I was lucky, but I talked to him on the phone all the time. Once, once a week back in those days, long distance was expensive, but, uh, uh, but I didn't get the hands-on instruction that a father would would like to give to his son to where he could pass on all that knowledge that he had. But I always thought it was strange because I knew he was a fairly conservative person in terms of his thinking. But when he would talk politics, he was not on board with the Republican Party. I really didn't understand it. But after I started studying about the Southern way of thinking about politics, I started to say, okay, well, you know, that makes sense now. I can see why he did that. He actually continued to vote Democrat up until the end of his life when he said, you know, those Democrats really do want to take away my guns. But he was a, he was a union yellow dog Democrat. He was a, you know, FDR Democrat to Harry Truman. And, uh, and he thought the Democrats were out there for the little guy. And when it came to wars, he often quoted this old saying, you know, rich man's war, poor man's fight. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a, a, a Southern saying you, you, I know at least goes back to the civil war. Cause I heard a, a Confederate veteran in his memoirs quoting it and it probably goes back further than that, but that's a way of looking at foreign policy that is not the mainstream Republican view. But, uh, but as you said, when I became Orthodox, it gave me a very different perspective on how the things that we were doing around the world were were actually playing out on the ground because you know had i not been orthodox when we were bombing the serbs i might not have paid enough attention to wow. care i might have bought the story that all oh, those evil serbs are just trying to kill everybody they're the bad guys uh, milosevic is just another hitler let's take them out and when the serbs got uh, the Serbs in the Kraina region of Croatia were ethnically cleansed with the help of the Clinton administration. You know, if I had not been Orthodox, I might not have noticed that, hey, that doesn't seem quite right because weren't we all mad at the Serbs because we were accusing them of ethnically cleansing uh, Kosovo, even though they actually weren't? Uh, and, and uh, you know, how is that okay? And to this day, most of those Serbs have never been able to return to their land. We're talking about a big chunk of Croatia that was majority Serb. Uh, and then the Iraq war, when we invaded Iraq, uh, the second time we, we destroyed a government that was actually protecting a 10% Christian population. And uh, Saddam Hussein was a strong man and he was brutal. But the thing is when you're the leader of a country that has different Muslim sects that want to kill each other, not to mention some Christian minority groups and other groups of various types. That's the only way you're going to keep people in line is to is to have people who would otherwise be fanatics know that there's going to be brutal retaliation if they step out of line. And so that was a country where, where Christians were able to live, work, and worship in peace. We took them out, and then that Christian population was totally destroyed. Either they were killed, in many cases raped and killed, or they uh, wound up as refugees in some you know, European country or the United States, but they're not in Iraq anymore. And so we have a community that's been there since, you know, almost apostolic times that is no longer there. And uh, there, as I mentioned in my talk, there are monasteries in Iraq and in Syria that were destroyed. We have no idea what historical manuscripts were lost because we did, you know, if, if we'd had scholars that had an opportunity to go in there and catalog these manuscripts, make copies of them, we would have known. But we'll never know now. And in Syria, when uh, when the jihadists came in there, they they destroyed one of the villages, one of the few places left on earth where people still spoke the language of Christ, Aramaic, and. Uh, those people wound up in, as refugees. Now maybe that village it will be able to come back and it'll survive. But once you destroy a, a village like that and people go off somewhere else that's safe, you never know whether those people are coming back or not. What a loss to humanity to have a language that is so important for us as Christians that might die out. There might not be anybody else that speaks it as a, as a living language. 
those are all things that the United States government did. And so because I was Orthodox, I was noticing these things, and particularly with, with, for me, what really pushed me over the edge in terms of taking a 180 view of America is no longer a good actor. Uh, th- th- this is, these are not just bad decisions made by otherwise <laughs> well-intentioned people was what we were doing in Syria, where we were intentionally empowering jihadists and trying to destroy the Assad regime uh, for reasons that had nothing to do with the well-being of the people of Syria and certainly not the Christian population. Because I've never met any Syrian Christians that want Assad to go because they know if he goes and we have al-Qaeda in charge, that they're going to be destroyed. They're going to all be either killed or they're going to be somewhere else. But they're not going to be in Syria anymore. And that's that's a loss. And if you're in Antiochian, this is where your patriarch lives. There, mm-hmm. There's so much history that that will go if that happens. And unfortunately, as we saw with with ISIS, I mean, they destroyed Nineveh. You know, the, the archaeological site of Nineveh had all these things that had been dug up by archaeologists over the last hundred years or so, and they were just destroying these things. So they saw them as idols and uh, and wanted to just blow them up. They blew up the tomb of the prophet Jonah. In Nineveh, uh, you know, they, they, there's just so many things that were lost, and our government did that. And so, when you start realizing, hey, maybe America's not such a good force in the world when it's doing this kind of stuff, and then you start looking at the Southern tradition, you realize that there in America, if you go back to the founding, you really had two ways of looking at how America ought to be. One was the Hamiltonian view, which is we need to have, he actually wanted a monarchy. He wanted a strong central government. He wanted America to be imperialist, basically to be on the same uh, track as the British, just an American version of it. And then you had the Jeffersonian perspective, which was, you know, we want to have a real Republican uh, system where we have states that are republics and uh, they're able to function with autonomy from the federal government. The federal government only has limited powers that have been delegated to it by the states. And Ver- Jefferson actually thought that maybe Virginia was too big and it ought to be broken up into smaller cantons like Switzerland. Because if you think about it, on a small scale, you, you know the people that you're voting for. And, and they know you. And because you know each other, they're not going to act in ways that are going to be detrimental to their community because they know it's going to reflect badly on them. But, um, you know, James Madison said that we should have about 30,000 constituents for every representative in Congress. Today, because they can't tell many people are in Congress, we're getting close to the point where we're going to have some congressmen representing a million people. Mm. Well, you know, Dan Crenshaw is my congressman. Dan Crenshaw doesn't give any care or he didn't have any thought about what I think. Right. If I wanted to set up a meeting with him, I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't be able to do it. I might be able to catch him maybe at a clergyman's gathering or something like that and have a word with him or something like that. But that's even pushing a little bit. And when I have seen him on video talking to constituents, he very clearly doesn't really care what people say to him because he knows he's in a safe district. Yes, he gets and he's going to get reelected. Off. He gets booed quite a bit. Yeah, he does because he he ran as a staunch conservative, and he's ran he's actually acted ever since as a you know a moderate Republican that's part of the Republican establishment. Mm-hmm. And he he's been a huge disappointment. I was excited about him when he first got on stage, and he he very clearly he's pr- he's never seen a war he didn't like, so he's right. basically. I patch McCain. He, mm-hmm. he, 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 he's John McCain with an eye patch, and he's younger. Mm-hmm. But but he's never seen a war he didn't like. He, he's always in favor of us uh, spending money to to fund these wars, and he's not doing anything about our debt. And uh, you know we're now over thirty trillion dollars in debt, not counting unfunded liabilities. And we're way past the point where we're probably ever going to be able to pay it off, at least not within anybody's lifetime that's here around today. Uh, but we at least stop the bleeding because the only thing that separates us from Argentina, where they had hyperinflation, I have a parishioner whose family comes from Argentina. He told me that 
when they had hyperinflation, people, as soon as they got a paycheck, they would go and cash their check and immediately buy anything they could get their hands on because they knew that whatever they bought would have some value and they could trade for it later. And while they were standing in the line, the prices of the things they were trying to buy were wow. going. So that's where we could be headed. The only thing that's kept us from going down that road, though, is that the dollar has been the world's reserve currency. Well, because of our heavy-handed financial policies and sanctions against countries like Russia and other countries around the world, I mean, we're sanctioning like about a third of the world in one, to one degree or another. At some point, when you keep beating people up, they're going to figure out a way to where you're not going to keep, be able to keep beating them up. No, nobody mm -hmm. likes to, have, to be abused. And so we're seeing de-dollarization right now. So we could be headed to hyperinflation. Well, this is all not good. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that changed my view on poor, foreign policy. But I also, as I was reading Southern Agrarian writers, started to realize that, hey, maybe this idea that we should just be for the corporations making all the money they can because we want to have all the jobs that we can get. Maybe there are some flaws here because these corporations clearly don't care about the people and they're more than happy to go overseas and take their business elsewhere if, there's, if they can make more money that way. And uh, in the meantime, we've, we've gone from a country where most people grew up on farms before World War II to a country where it's like less than 2% of the people grew up on farms. And we don't, rural communities around the country are dying because everybody's going to the city because they want to get a job where they can get a good paycheck. Well, we're destroying ways of life that, uh, that were rooted in things that kept made this country what it was in, in, in the good sense. And, uh, you know, we talked about the greatest generation of World War II. Why were they the greatest generation? Mm -hmm. Well, they, they had character that was formed by hard work and the life uh, on a farm. And uh, I, if we got into a similar kind of a war right now, I really don't believe. Well, like <laughs> we went through the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, people had strong communities and family connections and they helped each other out. Mm -hmm. uh, we are so disjointed now that I, 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 I shudder to think what it would be like if we went through something like that, particularly if it was followed up by a war where we had to really have people stepping up and sacrificing. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we just, I don't think we have the, the same kind of people that can pull that off. Yeah. <laughs> and there's people giggling right now listening to this. Yeah. There's, I, I've said before, there's not a lot of uh, trans and woke people in a bread line. You know, at, at some point, some, I called them, I, I got this from someone else. I can't remember who, luxury beliefs. Uh, and there's a lot, unfortunately, the more luxury we attain in America, the more of these insane beliefs you get. You, right. Excuse me. You had said, at the conference that uh, one of the pres uh, speakers there, Dr. Donna Livingston, kind of helped open up your eyes as you read some of his things about Southern agrarianism and the lifestyle. Right. And, and a friend of mine who, despite being, let's see, he's, a, he's an atheist and he's a hardcore, like self-described postmodernist. And he, he had said once, uh, the war of Northern aggression was America's first Afghanistan. And it had me thinking, and, and then some of the stuff I read from Dr. Livingston and some of the stuff you had said, it seems like this, maybe we can now call it like a neoliberal Yankee mentality of exporting what they thought was good over the little people they thought was bad is the thing that kind of won. And, and a lot of people, after 2020 happened, a lot of people are looking around going, maybe these agrarian lifestyles, people got into gardening and getting chickens and ranches and whatnot. Does it seem like that war of Northern aggression with the Yankees and it had ended up winning that? Is that basically what, what, what sprung this neoliberal that we have to uh, conquer everyone with our ideology because we're better than everyone else? Is that, do you see that as where it started? Well, I think that that's basically how things played out. I mean, to give you some idea of sort of the broad sweeps of American history, New England was settled by largely Puritans Yes. Who were the roundheads that, that were with Cromwell that wanted to force their religion on everybody else. And the South was largely settled by the Cavaliers that lost in, in, in the uh, uh, Civil War that Cromwell was successful in. 
uh, what happened was when Cromwell died, his son wasn't able to keep things together. And then Parliament went to the uh, successor to the king that they had beheaded and uh, asked him to come back. So the monarchy was restored. Uh, but uh, the, the, the Cavaliers were the, you know, the, the landowners, the, the, they, they were pro, uh, pro-monarchy at that time. And uh, they were more traditional in their thinking. Whereas the, the Puritan mindset is, is we're on a crusade. It's, it's a, a life or death struggle. It's a matter not even of just of, uh, of life and death, but it's a matter of your eternal salvation. And so you have to defeat the enemy. And uh, what happened was around the time of the American Revolution, these Puritans, their descendants started to lose their faith and they've started becoming Unitarian Universalists and eventually stopped even being that and became very secular. But the New England mentality never lost the idea that they were the chosen people on a mission to uh, evangelize everybody else and make them get into line. It's just their gospel became, you know, American democracy, so to speak. And, uh, and in the Civil War, that Hamiltonian, Puritanical, Cromwellian tradition was the one that wound up on the winning side of that war, and the, the Jeffersonian Cavalier tradition was defeated. And so the Southern tradition has never ceased to play some role in American politics, but it certainly was sidelined. And you only basically, you're basically hearing people complain in the gallery from a Jeffersonian perspective, uh, but they're not, they haven't been calling the shots. I mean, there've been a few presidents who you could say were Jeffersonians and Jimmy Carter, I would say was one of them. Uh, Grover Cleveland was another one, but, but, you know, they were only able to uh, undo the damage to some extent. So after the civil war, we had our first war of, of conquest internationally, which was the Spanish American war. And we, we, we basically took over a bunch of Spanish colonies around the globe. And uh, they also were, it was a way that the North also had former Confederate veterans involved in that war. And it was sort of like, okay, well, now we're all on the same team. And so a lot of Southerners actually got on board with this because, okay, you can't beat them, join them. You know, it's, you know let, let's, uh, let's, let's be with the winning side. But uh, after that, we had the the banana wars as they're called in South America where when Chiquita Banana would have uh, unionized workers that would start threatening to go on strike the Marines would come in and overthrow the government and uh, put a stop to that so basically we had the United States Marine Corps functioning as the enforcers for corporate interest and uh, and in World War One we got you know it, it, to some extent lied into that war. Uh, World War II is, is something that's debated, but a lot of people think that Pearl Harbor was allowed to happen because that was the only way we were going to get into the war was by having something like that happen. And if you watch like the movie Tora, 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 there's an awful lot of balls that got dropped. And you have to think that there was an awful lot of incompetent people <laughs> to believe that it just happened the way that it did. And, mm -hmm. uh, and nobody w was able to pay, you know, no one was, no one was ready at all. We didn't have a single plane in the air, uh, completely caught off guard. Uh, but be that as it may, when you, when you go beyond that, you go to the Vietnam War, we know we got lied into that. Yes. And uh, we definitely got lied into the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War. And we've gotten lied into all these other expeditions we've had, like in Syria. So the, the modus operandi of the American government is, uh, has been really since the Mexican-American War to create an incident and then look like we're the aggrieved victim. We've been attacked. And then, uh, and then go to war. Uh, and, uh, so that's what we, that's actually what Lincoln's policy was with Fort yes, Sumter. He provoked right. that incident so they could then say, we, the flag has been fired upon. Yes. And, uh, and then, you know, the main, you know, being blown up, we, we, we know now that that was not the Spanish that did that, mm -hmm. but we got, the country got talked into believing that they, some re for some reason, decided to blow up an American ship, uh, and, um, and every war. I mean, there, there might, there's probably some exceptions people could point us to, but, but we've been lied into an awful lot. I know a lot of you guys want to see more beauty in this world, in this culture, because modern art is so degenerate and nihilistic. 
it does seem that there's a huge need to share the beautiful Christian art. Some artists are working to keep tradition alive. My good friend and friend of the show, Amy Mastrini, Amy the artist, she's been painting for 11 years. She's an Orthodox Christian. She creates icons of Jesus Christ, Mary, the saints, and so on. Her work is done in oil and gold leaf. It's really, really nice. I have some pieces from Amy. It's the perfect opportunity to beautify your home or give a gift to your loved ones for a holiday or a birthday. She sells art prints, stickers, original paintings on her website. Go check it out, amy-the-artist.com. That is amy-the-artist.com. She is currently accepting commissions as well. She says a lot of her work is intended to honor the divine and sacred. How wonderful is that? Go check it out, amy-the-artist.com. Follow her on Instagram at amy underscore the underscore artist. Let's get back to the show. What's going on with Ukraine and Russia right now? Was NATO doing the same thing, provoking, provoking? Russia makes a move. Oh, look, they did something, you know? Yeah, I mean, whatever you want to say about what the Russians have done or are doing, I know without any doubt that our government could have prevented it all had they had any inclination to do so. Because Russia had very reasonable demands before they threw their weight into this. And it uh, would have been very easy to have met those demands. And, and Ukraine would be an intact country right now, minus Crimea. They're, they were not going to give Crimea back, but they only took Crimea because we sponsored a coup that overthrew the lawfully elected government in Ukraine. And various parts of Ukraine that were heavily Russian speaking didn't go along with that. And Crimea, we know that the Russian government... Uh, you know, it was involved in taking in, in, in you know, seizing the, the territory. But we also know from by our own polling that was done before uh, that all happened that a vast majority of the people considered themselves to be Russian and were and preferred to be part of Russia. And they were part of Russia up until the 1950s. It was Khrushchev that transferred Crimea to Ukraine. It never was part of Ukraine prior to that. And it's it's a very important a place where there's lots of military bases. And that's the reason why the Russians were not prepared to just let that one go and let let Crimea become a base for NATO. They they were not going to let that happen. But I would just remind people to think about what the United States would do under similar circumstances. Right. Uh, One war that comes to mind is, you know, Jimmy Carter, one of the things he did was he gave the Panama Canal back to the Panamanians. Well, Panama wouldn't even be an independent country if we didn't sponsor a, re- a revolution to break it off from Colombia because Colombia wouldn't let us build the Panama Canal. So we, we, we carve Panama off. We make them sign a treaty giving us the canal zone. And it's very strategically important to the United States. It's less so now, but it certainly has some strategic importance. Well, George H.W. Bush concocted some story about, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was Noriega, the, the, mm-hmm. the president of Panama, that he was, and he was, you know, attacking Americans, you know, at, at some checkpoint or something like that. And we took the whole country over because we thought the Panama Canal Zone was was threatened, even though we actually signed over an agreement to where we were giving increasing control over time back to Panama, which, after all, ought to have the control over the Panama Canal since it's their country. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we, we didn't hesitate to do that. Uh, over something a lot less than what we're yeah. talking about in, in in Ukraine, where we overthrew the lawfully elected constitutional republic of Ukraine and uh, installed people friendly to us. And we know that that happened because we've got yes. you know, recordings of Victoria Nuland talking with uh, uh, Jeffrey Pyatt, I believe is his name, about who they were selecting for the yes. prime minister. Well, you know, that that. That's not America acting well on the world stage. And if the shoe was on the other foot, we wouldn't have waited uh, between 2014 and 2022 to have entered it militarily with everything we had. Right. This, uh, this might seem to some people in the audience that I'm jumping all around, but it, the, this show often will focus on spiritual warfare. So I think that plays a part in everything we're discussing. I want to ask you about 2020. And I know you know um, some things I can't, say word wise on this without getting strikes, but do you, uh, Father Turbo, my spiritual father, I hope he's okay with me saying this. I, I think he would be. He believes that 
the events of 2020, especially if you follow certain timelines like the liturgical calendar, were an attack on the church. Have you thought about this or do you, do you, do you think about that? Well, I'm not sure what to, uh, connection with the church calendar he had in mind, but if, he, if, if I listened to him explain it, it probably would make sense to me. But um, I don't doubt that there's a spiritual aspect to what's going on. I can tell you my parish got a terrorist threat in June of 2020. Uh, and, uh, and so we kind of took it personally that, that, that we had someone trying to get other people to burn my church down. And, uh, and the FBI had absolutely no interest in it and never tracked the guy down. And I, as, as I've talked to people who, who, who have opinions on the matter, I think put them in a position to maybe have a good perspective on it. They think it's possible the FBI didn't do anything about it because the guy that was doing this was one of their assets and yeah. maybe he was trying to troll people. Maybe he was trying to see who would do such a thing. What I don't know is would they have burned my church down and then sprung the trap or would they have sprung the trap before they burned my church down? That's what I would like to know. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I hope you don't mind me bringing this up. I think it's been on my episode, one of my episodes, you brought it up before. Of course, they did find uh, some interest in speaking with you and it had something that had nothing to do with that that terrorist threat. Well, yeah, this was on April the 7th in 2022. So after Russia uh, got involved in, in the war directly, uh, almost two years have passed since I was trying to get the FBI interested in my parish. I get a visit from an FBI agent that uh, knocks on my door and he says, well, you know, we just want to make sure everything's okay. Uh, you know, we understand that a while back you had a threat uh, against your church and we know with the war going on, it could be, you know, there could be some other stuff going on. So we'd like to talk to you. And when he got, once he got in my house, all the questions were not about the safety of my parish or terrorist threats or what had happened in 2020 it was all about what kind of contacts have you had with the consul general of the, you know, the Russian consul general in Houston, and, you know, did, is, does the Russian church uh, or, or does the Russian government have any control over your church? Questions like that. And uh, so, so yeah, we were basically, and, and the thing, the thing is, we already know from what happened with, uh, you know, the, the, during the Trump years where people got busted because they answered questions and, and the FBI tried to say that they were lying because they answered a question a certain way that they construed as a lie, even though at the time the agents didn't think it was a lie. I was being very careful to make sure I told them exactly the best I, as I could recall everything that they were asking because, you know, the Russian consul general has shown up at uh, the other Rogue War parish for like their uh, Pascha, Christmas, their parish feast day. And I bumped into them on a few occasions, stuff like that. So I'm sure they know every time I've had contact with the Russian consul and they were just trying to see if I was going to tell them the truth or not. And if I had not, they probably would have, uh, like, then use that as leverage to try to get me to do other stuff that I wouldn't otherwise want to do. So, so that wasn't a pleasant experience, but yeah, that happened uh, in April on April the 7th, feast of the annunciation. Uh, right after I got home from liturgy, we had my granddaughter sit in my lap and was oh. playing music for her. that. that oh. My day was interrupted with that. Do you think there were some silver linings that came out of, well, I, let me say, let me preface it this way. I personally think there's silver linings that came out of 2020, 2021, et cetera. For well, one, I became Orthodox um, during that time and it had a lot to do with what was happening in the world. Did you see silver linings in your parish and Orthodoxy in general, things that we can look back upon and say, despite, you know, despite communism, many saints were made out of that. The, the church never died out, anything like that. Well, St. Paul tells us that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And that doesn't mean that everything that happens is good. It just means God's able to make it all work for good. And uh, so for 2020, up until last year, our parish almost doubled in size. Good. And we've never had the level of inquirers. And our church, obviously, is not the only parish that experienced this. But I think that what happened was is a lot of the things that people had always believed about the world and um, this country and to some extent their their faith that they had, a lot of those those things they were disabused of. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, 
So they suddenly were in a position where they were starting to look for answers. They were looking for something that they could grab a hold of that was, you know, uh, solid. And uh, and particularly, I think a lot of people who were Protestants or Catholics that had churches that shut down for months or years, in some cases, uh, it caused them to wonder, are these people, can this really be the the church that Christ founded, if these people are so afraid that they're not going to have services for that amount of time, even when the government's not forcing them to be shut down. Uh, so it, it opened up a lot of people to things that they probably wouldn't have been open to otherwise. And so I think a lot of good has come from it. It's interesting. Yeah, I, I came into 2020 atheist and came out of it orthodox, but when I had first heard of churches close, I was upset at everything closing. So when I heard of churches, I thought, well, that's not right for those people. Now going to the liturgy every Sunday, I cannot, well, first I can't imagine that <laughs> that our church would close. But if, I, I mean, I can't, like for my own soul, I can't imagine going through that. That would just, the fact that people were, well, okay, well, we'll give it six, like six months. I wouldn't want to give it six weeks, you know? Um, so, God bless the the bishops that allowed. I mean, I know our bishop allowed Roe Court to stay open down here, so that was uh, nice. And and you mentioned some. I know there's been a lot of converts from uh, Protestantism and, and Catholicism into Orthodoxy. Um, you yourself, can you talk about your religious past? Uh, it's kind of unique, and I I heard you recently saying that uh, the tradition you came from initially. Uh, were the people that were hooping and hollering and 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 then you know throwing hankies in the air and was it like tongues talking and things like that as well? Well, to give you a short history of the United States in terms of the, the major movements that it's experienced in the 19th century, you had the Second Great Awakening and, and that out of that came what is known as the Holiness Movement, and so the Holiness Movement emphasized being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and being empowered to live a life free of sin, so entire sanctification. So it wasn't the, the gift of tongues or a focus on the spiritual gifts. It was really a focus on living a holy life. And, um, but, their, but their worship had a lot of these same elements that you saw later in Pentecostalism, and it's not coincidental. One thing as I started digging into the history of my own church that I was raised in, was I started to realize a lot of the terminology the Pentecostals had co-opted was originally holiness movement terminology. But because the holiness movement didn't want to be associated with the Pentecostals, they gave up a lot of these terms. Like, for example, the word Pentecostal was used by the holiness movement. The Nazarene church used to be the Pentecostal church of the Nazarene. Okay. And the, the idea of the full gospel was a holiness phrase. Because the idea in the holiness movement was half of the gospel is that Christ can save you from your sins. In other words, you can be forgiven. But the other half of the gospel is that you can be empowered to live a life free from sin. So that was the full gospel. That was the rest of the story, as Paul Arby would say. Mm -hmm. Well, when the Pentecostals came on the scene, and actually the first Pentecostal church in Azusa Street, Los Angeles, was pastored by a black Nazarene pastor that started teaching people that they had to speak in tongues. And so his church changed the locks on him and kicked him out. So the Nazarene church burst, you could say, the Pentecostal movement, but it never wanted to be associated with it. So when the Pentecostals came on the scene, they, they started to dial back some of the stuff. But, but I, when I went to college, I went to college in uh, Southern Nazarene University in Bethany, Oklahoma, which is right outside of Oklahoma City. And while I was there, I was working in an office supply that was owned by a guy who, his father had been an old-time Nazarene evangelist. He'd lived in Bethany all of his life. And Bethany was basically founded as a Nazarene town. And you know, it grew beyond that to where not everybody there was a Nazarene, but there's still a big part of the population and certainly the history of the town. And he told me that back when he was a kid, there were tour buses from Oklahoma City that would go out to Bethany First Church of the Nazarene so that people could see these people jump in the pews and run through the aisles and hooping and hollering. And when I was there going to First Church of the Nazarene, that was like one of the most stodgy churches in town. There was nothing like that at all. But at one time, they were doing those kinds of things. 
so yeah, that that's uh, that was my background. Although you you would hear you would occasionally see some of that stuff, but it was way toned down by the time I was growing up, and it was not not the norm. And that would that was a Protestant denomination, is that correct? Right, it's part of the holiness movement. Okay. And, you know, to give you some idea, you know, the Holiness Movement largely came out of the Methodist Church, but the Holiness Movement was a lot, in a lot of ways like the Charismatic Movement mm -hmm. in that it crossed denominational lines. You had Presbyterians that were part of the Holiness Movement. You had Episcopalians that were part of the Holiness Movement. What happened was, is toward the end of the 19th century, a lot of the denominations started kicking these people out. So that's how the Church of the Nazarene wound up getting formed because... First, you had lots of small holiness denominations that formed, and then they all started merging together. There still are other holiness denominations. The Salvation Army actually is one of them. Most people don't realize they're even a denomination. They think of them mm -hmm. as a charity. Mm -hmm. But their beliefs are almost identical to the Church of Nazarene, except they reject baptism and communion. They, 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 they have, that's the strangest thing about their, their doctrines. Uh, they, they're totally anti-sacramental. Wow. But in every other respect, they have the same teachings as the Church of the Nazarene. Okay. Well, this confusion that you're speaking on offers me a, a, an on-ramp into asking you about, you have a, a very well-known piece called Sola Scriptura in the, van in the Vanity of Their Minds. And I should preface this with, this is not meant to offend anyone listening uh, who's a Protestant or whatnot. We're, I just want to get into some church history and some things that I know Father John knows quite well. Uh, first, I guess I'll ask you for my audience purposes to explain what sola scriptura means. And then I'd just like to say, if, if let's say the Salvation Army sect of Protestantism versus the Nazarene sect versus the Presbyterian sect, if they all believe in sola scriptura, for one, how, how would the Salvation Army say that they don't believe in communion? Because that's in the scriptures. So, we can jump off and, and get into this kind of territory. Well, I mean, that's a good example of how good people can look at the same Bible and read different things into it. Uh, William Booth, who was the founder of the Salvation Army, along with his wife, Catherine Booth, who was reputed to be a better preacher than he was, and they had lots of women preachers in the holiness movement, by the way. But... Uh, uh, he grew up in England, and he saw lots of people who had been baptized as infants in the Church of England, but they didn't have anything in terms of a real spiritual life. And so I think that he, in reaction to that, started to think, well, that all that bad, you know, baptism stuff and all that sacramental stuff is a bunch of hooey. That's not what makes somebody a Christian. What makes you a Christian is their relationship with Christ. And so basically they have their own... Like, like you, to become a, a salvationist, you sign the Articles of War. <laughs> and so instead of baptism, you, you enlist and sign the Articles of War, where you're pledging war against the devil and to be a, a soldier in God's army, and you become an enlisted man. And if you're, if you're an officer, you're a clergyman. And one thing about the Salvation Army, because of William Booth and Catherine Booth's history, if you're an officer, your wife is the same rank. And so they have the largest uh, percentage of women clergy of any denomination there is, uh, because it's almost 50%. <laughs> you know, what's interesting, though, is if you go to an actual Salvation Army church, at least in my experience, the women more often than not functioned a lot more like a matryoshka than they did as a co-pastor. Uh, but, but on paper, at least, they were still considered to be clergymen. And uh, uh, so they had, uh, they had their own sacraments that they made up, but they rejected the ones that were in the Bible. If you ask them, well, how can you reject baptism? They would say, well, why do you reject foot washing? Christ said to do this, and you don't consider that a sacrament. So they, they basically see baptism as being something that was important at one time, but not something that we were really supposed to do. How you could read the end of Matthew, where it says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. How you can read that and not see that as a commandment to do that forever, I don't know. But I almost became a salvationist because I liked a lot of the things they did. But for me, that was one thing I could not buy. I could not buy their view of the sacraments. But uh, soul scriptura is the idea that you're going to go by scripture alone. That's what it means literally in Latin. And uh, you, you, you could talk about 
vast differences among Protestant groups, but the one thing that they all have in common and without which they're not Protestants is a view that scripture is primary or it's the only thing. Some some will go so far as to basically say that there's nothing aside from scripture that we should pay any attention to. But even the ones like the Anglicans or the holiness movement for that matter, because they have a, a connection with the Anglicans via Methodism, they'll give some lip service to tradition, but they see, you, they'll say, well, but if the scriptures contradict tradition, we're going to go with the scriptures. But the problem with that is, is when you, when the fathers interpret a passage one way and you interpret it another way, it's not that the scriptures are contradicting tradition, it's that your interpretation is contradicting uh, the, the, the tradition of the church and its interpretation. So the question you should be asking is, why should I think that I'm the first person to come along to understand this correctly? Why should all these church fathers and saints, why should the belief that the church held uh, going back to the beginning be overridden? Because I look at the Bible and I don't see it that way. And, you know, it, good people can look at the Bible and they can argue themselves into seeing very different things there. And so mm -hmm. it just is not a approach that works. Whereas when you understand scripture as being properly understood within the context of the tradition of the church, you have a means of interpreting scripture that actually is connected with the people who wrote it. <laughs> and uh, it has apostolic and divine authority. We believe the Holy Spirit guides the church and it keeps us on, uh, on an even keel. I and for me, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. But for me, what really pushed me over the edge in the direction of realizing I could not be a Protestant anymore was I read the epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch. St. Ignatius wrote seven epistles before he was martyred in Rome. He was the Bishop of Antioch. He was ordained the Bishop by the apostle John. <laughs> so he was a disciple of the apostle John. And when I read his epistles, I realized that I wasn't in the same church that he was in because he talked about no church that doesn't have bishops, priests, and deacons can even be called a church. He talked about heretics who abstain from the Eucharist and communion because they don't believe the Eucharist to be the body and blood of Christ. Uh, they're just, I, I, I could go on citing you things that he said, but there's just no way you can be a Protestant and say you agree with St. Ignatius. Uh, so for me, that's what made me realize I, I'm not in the right church, so I need to find the right church. I need to find the church that St. Ignatius belonged to. Mm -hmm. And just to to uh, hit it up one, once again, he was uh, a disciple of John from the Bible, correct? I just want to emphasize that for the people listening. Right. right. And there's a tradition that actually, he's called St. Ignatius the God-bearer. And the word in Greek, God-bearer, could also be understood as God born. And there's a tradition that he was the child that Christ said, unless you become like this child, you'll in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Now, whether that tradition is true or not, it gives you some idea of his age. He was, he was probably a child around the time of, of Christ. And, uh, we know that he knew the apostles mm -hmm. and, uh, so if the apostles were such horrible teachers that they couldn't pass on the faith even one generation, then I guess we're all <laughs> in a world of hurt. But I tend to think that the apostles weren't such horrible teachers and they were at least able to pass it on to one generation. And the fact that the apostle John made St. Ignatius the bishop of Antioch, was, which was the most important center of Christianity at the time, would indicate that St. John thought that St. Ignatius knew what he was talking about. Mm-hmm. And you just mentioned the translation to Greek. One thing that, that seems obvious to me is if, if you believe in Sola Scriptura, well, there's so many translations and new versions and updates, quote unquote, updates of, of the Bible. And I've learned in my short time within Orthodoxy, just a one word switch here and there throughout the centuries makes a massive difference in the entire meaning of a verse or a chapter or whatnot. So... I assume, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to have a leading question here, but I assume that's got to be an issue with this, correct? Right. And that's one of the reasons why, when, you know, I think in the early days, Protestants just thought, well, hey, it's obvious. We'll just go with the Bible. We're going back to the original sources. We don't need church tradition. But when they started seeing this multiplication of denominations that were coming up with wildly different interpretations, they started trying to find some interpretive key to unlock the meaning of scriptures that would be dependable. 
And ultimately, what they wound up doing was developing what's now known as historical critical exegesis. So Protestants, you know, biblical scholars and pastors are generally very concerned about learning biblical uh, Greek and Hebrew. And uh, they've done a lot in terms of analyzing the language, analyzing the manuscripts, because they're trying to get as precise to the meaning of the, of the text as possible. So they've actually done us a lot of favors because, you know, we've got all kinds of reference material out there that they've produced. But the bottom line of it is, is even though that kind of scholarship has a veneer of a sort of a scientific uh, objectivity to it, it's not. And even among great biblical scholars, you have them come, you, they come out on wildly different ends of the spectrum because it ultimately winds up being subjective and uh, not, it's not, I mean, they obviously they, they try to base their arguments on the text, but you know, for example, there, there's a principle that's often cited, uh, which you even find some followers saying things along this line, but basically let the clear passages interpret the unclear passages. But the problem is if I'm a Calvinist, Mm-hmm. The clear passage for me is Romans 9, and uh, and the unclear passages are all those mm-hmm. passages that talk about the fact that whosoever will, God God desires that all be saved. You know, those are the unclear passages. But if I'm a, a, a Nazarene, then the unclear passage is Romans 9, and the clear passages are all those passages that talk about God not, be, be, not willing that any man should perish. And uh, so... It, 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 it still winds up being subjective unless you have an interpretive tradition that, that holds you in check. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, in the Orthodox Church, you occasionally have somebody who looks at the text and they come up with something that you might say is an original interpretation, but they, they have enough sense to realize, well, you know, I think I'm seeing something here. Maybe it's really not there, but I, you know, I don't find this in the Father, so you can take it for what it's worth is the way most Orthodox scholars or priests would put it if they thought they saw something like just to give you an example i've never read anybody who who made this connection but i think it's interesting that if you look at the prophets elijah and elisha and their names in hebrew elijah means my god eli means my god and then is is implied is yah or yahweh my god is yah and elisha means my god is salvation and if you take the last parts of both of their names and put them together, you get the name of Jesus in Hebrew. <laughs> I've never seen anybody point that out. There's no mm-hmm. church followers, so far as I'm aware, that's ever pointed that out. I think that's interesting, but that could just be me. You know, mm-hmm. maybe, you know, I, I, I certainly don't want to give that any authority that's that's undue. I think it's interesting, but uh, uh, but I certainly would never, you know, try to start some new school of thought based on something like that because if right. it's not in the fathers. It probably is not crucial. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's not I a be- crucial point. I believe Luther might have thought the unclear uh, writings would have been in James, correct? That's right. James was an epistle of straw that he wanted actually to kick out of the canon of Scripture altogether. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's another uh, example. And then an obvious question that I would ask, if, if one believes in sola scriptura, meaning the Scriptures alone, is sola scriptura in the Bible? And that's one of the key Achilles heels of Sola Scriptura, and that's that it's not, not only is it not in the Bible, but the Bible tells you that there are things not in the Bible that you should believe. <laughs> now, St. Paul tells us to hold fast to the traditions that you've received, whether by word or my epistle. Right. And St. Paul talks about passing on the traditions that he received. And he, he talks about, particularly right before he starts talking about women covering their heads, and the thing that you have to understand is, had there not been a controversy in Corinth about women covering their heads, we would probably never know that that was the tradition. But St. Paul says, this is the practice of the whole church. You know, if, if anybody doesn't agree, you know, tough noogies, this is, this is what everybody always, has always done. But that's the only place in the Bible where it's even discussed, and yet we know from tradition that this was the normal practice for women to cover their heads. And, and, he, and he appeals to this tradition that he received from Christ, and he's passing on to us. Well, there's a lot that the apostles passed on to people that was not written down in the New Testament. Now, 
probably all the, the traditions that were passed on have been written down someplace or another by now. Uh, but, um, but maybe not. I mean, you, but there are things that the church has certainly preserved uh, that were true from the apostle. I mean, here's a good example of this. You know, if you examine the liturgy itself, there is a, a shape to the liturgy, as Dom Gregory Dix talks about in his book, The Shape of the Liturgy, that clearly goes back to the apostles. But that's not spelled out in the New Testament. There's no place in the New Testament where it tells you how the Eucharist was celebrated or how the liturgy was celebrated. Um, and uh, in our worship, there are prayers that we do that have verbal parallels to things that Jews still do in their synagogues. Mm -hmm. The only historical explanation for how the church would have wound up with Jewish practices in its worship is that it came from the apostles. Because it's not like in the third century or in the fourth century after the time of Constantine, the Christians would have said, you know, those Jews do some cool stuff. Let's do what mm -hmm. they're doing. Right. That, that right. would not have happened because the Jews and the Christians, at least the Jews that, were, that rejected Christ, because there were Jews that were Christians as well, but they didn't have a lot of friendly contact with each <laughs> other. And, uh, and so the Christians would have been looking over their shoulder and copying them. Right. Uh, something else I would, that's, that's crossed my mind. If, if one believes in Sola Scriptura, well, the, as we know, obviously the Bible wasn't put together, published widely available to your average person for centuries. What, so what would the people prior to that, what should they have believed if not for tradition and the spoken word? Well, certainly in the first century, most people would not have had anything like a New Testament like we have now. And it was only towards the second half of the century, the first century, that you began to have the, the Gospels and the, and what the epistles actually came before the, the Gospels. And so the last Gospel, you know, was, depending on who you're listening to, might have been written uh, as early as, you know, say, you know, the, the late 60s or as late as the 90s. Uh, uh, but, um, the average Christian wouldn't have had access to everything in the New Testament even by the end of the first century. It's only as those things were collected and circulated. And then there, were, there was not full agreement about which book should be included and which book should not be included. So even as late as the fourth century, you have manuscripts that were produced of the entire Bible that included the epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch and the New Testament or included First Clement. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and then there were canons of scripture that did not include Revelation or did not include, uh, you know, Second Peter or Jude. So th 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 there was a, this time period where people were kind of sorting out what is, what, what, what do we believe is apostolic? And it's only, you know, the first complete list of the New Testament books that we have is the, is the Paschal Epistle of uh, St. Athanasius the Great in the fourth century. Uh, listing the, all the books of the New Testament, but even he talks about these other books from the New Testament period, like the Shepherd of Hermas, the Didache, mm -hmm. um, that were, were also important, but they, they, he didn't include them in the New Testament canon. But if you look at his Old Testament canon, it's pretty close to the canon that, uh, that we have, but actually there's, there, there's, I think the book of Esther is missing and the book of Baruch is listed as among the canonical books. And then among the, the readable books, as he calls them, he lists the deuterocanonical books. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so that's about as close as we get to something like the index to your King James Bible, but it still wasn't entirely the same even then. Uh, I'll ask you this. I got to get you out of here soon, and this won't be controversial to anyone at all. But I, over the years, as, as Protestantism splits up into, I think it's thousands of denominations and just modernity and, and as time passes, one, do you think there's been, I hate to even call it this, let's, let, me, let me think of a better term, a, um, let's say some confusion on heaven, hell, Hades, and salvation, and then throwing in the rapture with that as well. Well, there's a lot of confusion on those points. One of the things is the unfortunate history of how the word hell has been used in English because in the New Testament, there are actually three words that talk about uh, stuff that you might associate with hell. One is Hades, which the word hell is 
Hell it was the name of the Germanic goddess of the dead, and Hades is the Greek god of the dead. And so they both re- refer to the abode of the dead as these two pagan groups saw it. And so it was considered to be a good translation of the Hebrew word Sheol. But uh, the, the other word was Gehenna, mm-hmm. which is just used, transliterated into Greek. And a lot of times when Christ talked about hell, he's using the word Gehenna, but more often than not, when it's translated as hell on the King James, it's Hades. And they're not talking about the same thing. The third word is Tartarus, which I think is only used once. And that's referring to the place of punishment for the angels. But, uh, but Hades is just the abode of the dead. And when you read the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, uh, they're both at Hades. They're, they're both in the same place, but they're not experiencing the same thing. This is the abode of the dead. This is before the resurrection of Christ. But those who were getting a foretaste of their a reward with the righteous were in the bosom of Abraham, as we call it. And then the rich man was separated by a gulf that separated the one group from the other and was in flame and torment. But uh, he was not in Gehenna yet (laughs) because Gehenna is something that people only get put in at the end of the age. That's something that no one is in right now. And so that's the lake of fire, uh, the ultimate place of punishment. And so there's confusion about that. But when you're talking about the rapture, nobody believed in the rapture like Protestants, at least some Protestants believe, until about 1850. I think it was a guy with the last name Darby who was a Baptist minister mm-hmm. and started teaching this. And then it became popularized because of a Confederate veteran, uh, 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 Schofield, uh, produced the Schofield oh, Reference Bible. Yes. And the the reason why the Schofield Reference Bible was so popular was, I believe it was the only Bible available for a very long time where you had references that explained obscure words in the King James Version. So a lot of people who didn't have any particular theological bent along the lines of Schofield just liked it because when they ran across a, a word or a phrase that was obscure, they knew that they would have an explanation in the margin that would tell them what the text meant. Uh, but he was an advocate of uh, dispensationalism, and so that popularized it. And then more recently, uh, oh, what's the name? The, the late great planet Earth guy. Uh, his name's escaped me at the moment. It'd probably come to me while we're talking, but but uh, he, he was a big-time dispensationalist in the 70s especially. That book, The Late Great Planet Earth, uh, was very, very popular. He was basically, he saw the end times in terms of the Soviet Union and the United States having a nuclear exchange. Hal Lindsey. And, and, and Hal Lindsey, that's right. And, and the Soviet Union invading Israel and getting defeated and, you know, the communist Chinese, you know, helping them along. Uh, and there's this tendency among Protestant uh, prophecy guys that they, they read the Bible and they've got one eye on the news page and so whatever's going on, they start trying to connect it to that. So during the Gulf War, they were emphasizing all these references to Babylon and the prophecies and stuff like that. Oh, well, here's the key now. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if the late great planet Earth is still selling very much, but I'm sure it's been revised quite a bit because a lot of it's outdated. But the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture makes absolutely no sense when you look at it from a traditional perspective because basically what Hal Lindsey wants you to believe and so surely God would want his people to go through the great tribulation to suffer. So he's just going to take them all out right before the great tribulation happens. But somehow there are people getting baptized and converting to the Christian faith, even though there's no church for them to be converted by or received by or baptized by. So it makes no sense. The church has gone through many great persecutions. So why would we think that the great uh, tribulation would be an exception? And the great in the, in the book of Revelation, it talks repeatedly about the church suffering uh, during this period of time. So it doesn't make any sense, but it became very popular. And so for a lot of uh, evangelicals to question the rapture will be right there with questioning the divinity of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, and the virgin birth. You know, I, you don't believe in the rapture? You know, you're, what kind of an atheist are you? Uh, but this was something no one believed prior to about 1850. Interesting. Okay. 
Well, um, I guess we can close on that. I'll actually close on this because it's a, it's a it's a high note too. I actually think I might know some answers to it, but I want you to get this out there. What makes you happy day to day? <laughs> well, one thing that makes me happy is my grandkids. If you, if, I enjoyed I enjoyed having my own kids, but grandkids are really on another level. And I had my grandkids over today, and so I got them always looking forward to spending time with them. And I got another grandbaby on the way. So that's a big part of it right there. I certainly enjoy seeing, you know, my church, uh, you know, prospering and people come into the faith. And it's always a pleasure for me to introduce people to the faith and to be able to explain things to them in a way that leads them uh, to convert. Uh, but the first thing that would come to my mind would be my grandkids. Excellent. That's what I thought. And, uh, <laughs> Plug anything you'd like. I know we we listed the web addresses up top, but anything you'd like, Twitter, uh, your, the Telegram group, um, church website, any of it. Well, I'm on, I'm on Twitter, I'm on uh, Gab, and I'm on Telegram, and I'm not hard to find. And, uh, and I've been producing some videos about how to do reader services. I've been talking about doing it for a long time and actually started doing it this year. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I do think with the lockdowns that we kind of got a warning, you know, this was sort of like a test run. So we got a preview of what things might be like in the future. And I think that while you have the freedom to do it, you have the freedom to buy the books that you need and to learn the things that you need to learn. Orthodox Christians should be learning how to do services at home because it could, you could be in a situation where that's the only church you're going to have. And, uh, just like when the hurricane is coming in the Gulf, when, 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 when they're already saying on the news that there's a Category 4 hurricane getting ready to hit, it's too late for you to do a lot of preparation because uh, the, the stores are getting picked clean and you're not going to be able to get the tree trimmers out there to trim, trim that tree that's getting ready to fall on your house. You have to prepare before the hurricane is there. So if you want to prepare for how bad things might get, you need to prepare now. And if it doesn't happen and you just get to be a pious Orthodox Christian that knows how to do a reader service, which will come in handy anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's excellent. Excellent uh, advice. Father John Weifert, thank you so much for being here on Counterflow once again. Thank you. What a great chat, as it always is with Father John. Father John is active in the Counterflow Telegram group. If you're not in that group, join it. Let's see another group you could join, which is active once a month. We meet once a month for our Zoom call. Just you guys, me, and a guest. It's not recorded. It's not published. It's private. We can say whatever we want. It's become like a second family for me. Patreon.com slash counterflow. $5 or more per month gets you into this club. And once a month, we meet up and have great discussions. We'll be doing that soon here this month in October before I head up to Pennsylvania for the Halloween time period. Let's see. Subscribe to the page on YouTube. Every Tuesday night, these episodes drop. It's 7 p.m. Central Time, and uh, I'm always there in the live comments. And speaking of comments, I don't know if... Do you guys follow me on Twitter? At Buck Rebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. I had one hilarious moment this last week. This is going to age me, but for my younger audience, you might not know who this is. For the guys and girls, let's see. I would say if you're 35 and up you're going to know who Twisted Sister is, the old glam metal band from the 80s. I loved them as about a 9, 10, 11-year-old. In fact, when I first learned to play drums in Los Angeles as a young boy, I asked my drum teacher, I said, I want to learn We're Not Gonna Take It by Twisted Sister. And I did. I still remember getting that drum music, the sheet music. I learned it. And then recently I learned that Dee Snyder, the lead singer of that band, is really, really bad on uh, the Koof stuff. He's very pro-jab. He was very pro-mask and locked down. He was terrible, which I found ironic for a man that's saying, we're not going to take it. And he was posting on Twitter about getting his 12th booster or whatever he's up to now. And I said, it's wild to see guys who portray themselves as rock and roll wild rebels then shill for the establishment. Well, he quote tweeted me. Boy, I upset him with that one. He said, you really have no idea who I am or what I stand for, do you? A simple Google search will give you all the answers, wild man. I stand for all the things I've always stood for. 
it's you who changed. That seemed like a, either a weird, he was admitting something that I didn't know. Basically, he's always been kind of a shill for the establishment, some kind of weird cell phone. I wasn't sure where he was going with that. But now, I will say I was absolutely elated to see that on Twitter. I was getting my hair cut. My barber said, it happened right before I walked in and she said, I've never seen you smile this big. What are you doing? What happened? And I will also say the comments from his fans under all of that, wow, there are still folks, there are still a lot of people out there, way more blue pill than you could imagine. And sometimes I think we're in this bubble where you think, well, most people get this generally, you know, the, the jab and whatnot. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. A lot of them still don't. I was told things that, of course, I don't believe in science. I'm a moron. They, well, I won't tell you some of the things they said, but among them were, oh, you'll see when you get COVID and you die because you don't have the jab. And it's like, wow, it's 2023. Who still thinks that? Interesting. Anyway, I had to um, tell you guys about it to say, see, follow me on Twitter if you want these fun times at Buck Rebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. And until next week, when I have a returning guest to the show, and uh, I'll leave it at that. He's got a new book out. How about that? You guys have a great week. We'll see ya. You get split in half, cause I call the hologram wrath. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash your sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.